All right, students, welcome back to the Cisco Packet Tracer introduction course. Again, my name is Keith Gebhardt, your instructor for the duration of this course. And in this section of the course, we're going to start learning how to set up a layer two lab. Now, you also notice on the right hand side of your screens, I do have some notes for some of you that might not be so familiar with network fundamentals, just to kind of bring you up to speed on what we're talking about. And then as we move forward, it'll start making more sense. But I do have a suggestion for you. If you guys are interested in learning more about network fundamentals or Cisco iOS administration type features that are a bit beyond the scope of this course, I do have a great option for you. You guys could go ahead and navigate to my Cisco CCNA RS iOS Administration Labs course. This course will cover a lot of very important information for both of you guys or any of you guys out there seeking your Network Plus or Cisco certifications. Quite frankly, because this will provide you with all the information you need for operating Cisco equipment. So when you're learning Network Plus, you can put those concepts into perspective. As well as you guys going for your CCNA, this is all criteria expected for you to be known really to be able to pass your ccna we'll go over a lot of understanding the hardware the boot sequences the file systems we'll set up different routing labs we'll set up different switching labs i did cr throw in a bonus here which i originally wasn't anticipating on doing but i go into a lot of routing concepts core routing default static dynamic routing a dynamic routing protocol which we're going to use in this course here i'm talking about which is rip version 2 we're going to talk about how to set up a static route dynamically using RIP version 2 using what we call a default originate. And then we also talk about a lot of the administration protocols, NTP, DNS, TFTP, syslog, DHCP, and password recovery. Along with this course, you also get an awesome workbook, which goes over everything we are doing and talking about in this course from A to B. That way you have a full and complete understanding. And as you can see here, this will be ultimately the lab that you create in that course so you can see it's going to be a lot more complex than what you're learning in this course. It'll really give you a great understanding of all these different technologies we can implement on our networks today. And again, as I said, it's a workbook, so I do give you all the configurations so you can follow along step by step. It's a great course. Um, I highly recommend it. It'll be extremely beneficial for any of you trying to learn Cisco thoroughly. So with that said, if you look at your screens right now, you'll see a discount coupon that if you go ahead and enter that into the course purchase page for any of you in the United States, it'll be $10. I'm sorry, I don't know what the conversion rate is for any of you outside of the United States, but for US dollars, it'll come out to $10. And you can take that using the coupon that you see on your screen right now. So let's get started. So the first thing I do want to bring to your attention is when we're talking about building networks as far as layers, we're typically talking about them as the architecture models. So we have two, we have a TCP, IP in an OSI architecture model. The TCP IP is the newer five layer model and then the OSI model is the older seven layer model. But, okay, we actually use the uh, OSI model to reference networks to this day. For that reason, it's because it's a lot more specific. Since we have seven layers, we could really be a lot more specific on where we are talking about with different communications and protocols within our networks by using the OSI model to reference it. Now, when we're talking about networking, we're typically only concerned with layers one through four. Now, some may argue we're only concerned with layers two through four, and that's actually 100% correct. For the communication of our data through a network, we are only concerned with layers two, three, and four. However, I don't 100% agree with that because for our communication to communicate through a network, we need to be concerned with layer one, the physical layer, which is our cabling and the transmission of all the bits going through our cable media, the cat five, cat six, cat six A, whatever. Okay, you need to know that. When we're connecting different devices, okay, we need to be able to con connect them using that physical layer. Layer two will be our data link layer switching and with switching we're concerned with physical addressing or MAC addressing. Layer three is our network layer, which we're concerned with the IP protocol or routing. Now, one thing to also keep in mind is routers are the only devices that separate broadcast domains. And when we talk about broadcast domains, you can think of them as the same as a network or a subnet of a network. So when we talk about a broadcast domain being separated, it's just a completely different network. For example, if I have a 192.168.1.1 IP address, okay, this would be a 1.0 network ID. And then I have a 192.168.2.0 network ID. Since this is a class C, 24-bit mask, okay, which is a class C, 
So we're only worried about the first three octets. Since this third octet here, the 24th bit in the mask, is a 2 and this is a 1, we know these are two separate networks. So if we're talking about a layer 2 network and we implement multiple bro or subnets like this right here, right, they will not communicate. They need to be in the same broadcast domain unless we have a router which will now communicate these two different broadcast domains or, again, subnets together. Layer 4 is a little bit outside of the scope of this course, but it's important to know that that is included in the whole conversation of networking because this is where we're talking about the transport layer and we are concerned with the ports that are being utilized, like what ports are being opened for our communication process to take place. Another very important thing, out of a box, a router will not work. Remember, we mentioned that previously. We actually need to configure routers to be able to communicate and work. All interfaces on a router are shut down by default. On the other hand, with a switch, okay, so I'll just say switches, not switched, switches, work right out of the box. We do not need to configure them. We could plug right into a switch and they will work. In fact, out of a box, by default, all ports on a single or on a Cisco switch are considered to be a single broadcast domain. Again, you could think of these broadcast domains as the same subnet. Okay, very important. So these notes may help you out. If you're new into networking, take notes of them. If you're already reading about it through Network Plus or CCNA, it does not hurt to rewrite them down again. Remember, repetition, repetition, repetition is going to only benefit you tremendously. So to get started, what I want to do is open up a new version or instance of Cisco Packet Tracer on your computers now, as I do here. And the very first thing we want to do is save this as something. And I'm just going to say layer to lab. I already had one created. Save it. Yes, do I want to overwrite it? No problem. That was from an old course I taught. So this is fine right here. And the reason why we do this is because as we move through this course, you'll keep telling or hear me tell you guys to say control S, which is saving this lab so we don't accidentally lose anything that we're doing on it. Up at the top, you'll notice, by the way, it shows you the path in which you did save that file, where the where that file exists within your computer. Since we are talking about layer two in this section of the course, what do you think we need to do? What media or what hardware devices are we adding into this topology? Switches. So we could go down here since we are already in network devices, right? We have routers, we have switches, we could click switches. And for this course, we're just going to use the 2960. So you can see I'm clicking and dragging, or I could just click it once again as a review, click it again and drop it, and all is hunky dory. Now, I do want to, in fact, rename these switches. I'm going to go ahead and rename this one to uh, left switch, just to keep things simple. And I'm going to name this one right switch. All right, nothing crazy, simple. Again, it's just good to keep good documentation, just better helps you throughout your studies. Now, since these are like devices, we're actually going to use a crossover cable to connect these two. So if I go over to my lightning bolt here, which is my connections, you'll see our crossover cable is this guy right here with the three dotted lines. Now, on a lot of newer equipment that you run into today, in fact, within the past several years, our Cisco switches have what's called auto sensing. So it's automatically going to determine if I am plugging into another switch or a host. And since I'm plugging into another switch, it's going to say, well, I need to flip out my input and output or essentially transmit and receives to be able to send and receive information to the same device. OK, because the, the devices by default are accepting the same as the other switch, so it would just conflict. So if we use a straight through cable here, the switch is smart enough to say, you know what, we need to reformat or reprogram that specific interface, only that one interface to reverse the transmit and receive so it works properly but for your studying you need to know these cables we're going to use a crossover cable so i'm going to be consistent i'm going to plug in a crossover cable to fast ethernet zero one on the left switch over to the right switch into fast ethernet zero one as well again consistency just really helps you understand as you move forward the next thing we want to do is actually kind of hover over the switch so we're talking about all these broadcast domains. Remember I said switches work out of the box. We do not need to reconfigure the ports or anything for them to work. All ports on a Cisco switch are considered a single broadcast domain or in the same subnet by default. So I could plug in any device into any single one of these available ports on this switch and they have to be in the same subnet because they are going to be considered one broadcast domain. We'll bring that up here in a second in further detail. The next thing I want to do is actually add our host devices to these, uh, you know, our switches here. So let's go to 
end devices, end user devices are essentially hosts, right? So we could just add a generic PC. I'm going to go ahead and add a laptop here. Nothing crazy, just something simple. I'm going to add a, uh, we could add another laptop over here if we wanted to. Again, you could add whatever you, whatever you fancy. And I'll add a server. Now, one thing I do want to do is address these in the name. Now, when I address them here in the name, that's not affecting the physical address on that actual end user device. It's just, and it's a visual aid for us to be able to determine what that computer is. And it just helps us later on when we're trying to test different connectivity between devices. So we'll use 192.168.1. Now, I typically use dot one as a default gateway. So we're not going to use that here. Later, when we implement routing, we need to set up a default gateway. So we'll go back to that. But I'm just going to start off at dot five. And again, this is going to be your standard class C subnet mask, which is a CIDR notation of 24 or slash 24. The laptop, we could give 192.168.1.6 slash 24. This laptop, what do you think? 192.168.1.7 slash 24. And then our server, we could do a 192.168.1.8 slash 24. Again, I'm just keeping these consistent just to make our lives a little bit more simpler as we go ahead and learn all these different technologies and build our topologies. As you can see, I try to make things nice and neat. Now, to connect our end user devices to a Cisco switch, or really any switch in that matter, if you're connecting to a Netgear switch or Juniper switch or what have you, your end user devices or hosts are going to be using a straight through cable. So we could use a straight through cable from Fast Ethernet 0 into any port on the switch. Because remember, all ports on a Cisco switch are considered a single broadcast domain. They're all in a same subnet. Okay, so we could plug them in virtually any one of these ports and they'll communicate once they are addressed. So here I'm just going to go ahead and plug it in 0, 2 just to keep it simple. The laptop, fast ethernet at zero from the laptop into left switch to fast ethernet at zero three. Again, laptop over here, the 1.7 laptop, I'm going to do fast ethernet at zero to the switch into fast ethernet at zero two. And then again, a straight through cable from the server from fast ethernet at zero into the right switch at fast ethernet at zero three. Now you'll notice some of the links are green, some of them are amber. And that's something on Cisco switches that's called spanning tree protocol. Essentially, what the spanning tree protocol prevents is loops within a switched network. That is completely outside the scope of this course. However, it's something to be aware of. So if you're noticing those amber lights, it's 90% of the time in packet trace are going to be because spanning tree is learning that that port can be open to send and receive data because it's an end user device. If we had a third switch up here and a triangle of cables, so it created a redundant link, if you will, Spanning tree will actually start taking place and create what's known as a root bridge. Okay, it's going to designate one as a root bridge so we don't have a bridge loop in our network, which are bad. It will catastrophically take down your network. You do not want bridge loops happening in your network. So right there is our layer two topology we're going to be working with in this network. I'm going to go ahead and con a, uh, do a control S. It saves it. Now, when I'm talking about this is going to be a single broadcast domain, I'm just going to grab my circle here. You do not need to do this. I mean, you can if you want. And we'll just use a light green of some sort. And if I draw a circle here, when I'm saying the same broadcast domain, I simply mean any device that falls within this green circle must be in that same subnet. As I talked about over here, everything that we address these end user devices are in the 1.0 network. Right, 1.5, 1.6, 1.7, 1.8, meaning they can cross communicate. They will be in the next section. We will, or next lecture, we'll cover that. If I address one of these computers to be a dot two, all of the sudden it's in a new network. Remember, a broadcast domain is the same as a different network or a different subnet. So if that would mean it would need a router to separate those broadcast domains or subnets. Pretty cool. To put this into a little bit more of a real world perspective. Let's take a look at how your homes would be communicating. Now, you do not need to follow along with this. This is just a visual representation for you. I could set up a cloud here. This cloud we could essentially represent as our internet. And our internet is nothing more than a bunch of service providers connecting to each other. Okay, that's what the internet is. That's what the cloud is. So the cloud, in fact, I'm going to write a note up here. Let's say we're trying to reach Google, which is 8.8.8.8 .8 .8 .8 for testing purposes. That's Google's DNS. 
So this is Google on the other side of the country or wherever. This is our internet. We'd have a wire coming in here and it would connect to a DSL or cable modem. So we'll just drop a modem in here. In your houses, however, you would have a Linksys router of some sort. In fact, we call these more or less as a as like a gag a joke in the industry, a swouter because they are switches and routers. In fact, if I hover over this router, you're going to see we have four Ethernet ports, which are switched. And that's just like how your home networks would be. Pretty cool, right? So now, for example, maybe you have a single desktop in your house that is using a straight through cable to connect like you know hard connected into this router into any of the ethernet ports on that switch or router really and then maybe i also have a laptop over here sitting on you know i'm sitting on my couch i want to connect wirelessly in fact a lot of things in your homes these days are wirelessly i mean even if you had like a smart device like a phone here or something right well if i go into this okay i could go ahead to the oh, i'm sorry physical turn this computer off, pull the the RJ45 NIC out by clicking, holding, and dragging, and then I could pull in the NM1W wireless NIC. That gives me a little antenna. Turn this back on, and let me just move this down here or over here. You'll see I got wireless connectivity to it. So that's how your house is connecting different devices. But essentially, this here in my square is its own broadcast domain. And then everything outside of this is it's is a completely different broadcast domain that is going to be a public network, opposed to what your own house is and the devices in your house are going to be considered a private network. So that's just a little bit more of a real life type example of what a uh, broadcast domain is, just so you could kind of differentiate the two. All right, guys. So in the next lecture, we're going to actually start doing some configurations on our actual devices. And then we're going to start learning how to communicate these together. We're going to learn some base switch configurations, and we will be moving right along. All right, guys, I will see you in the next one.